Um, uh, so, so it's my pleasure in Mark's place today um, to welcome our speaker on behalf of the McLean Center, the Center for Health and the Social Sciences, and the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Excellence. Um, uh, our speaker in, in today's um, uh, instance of our, our lecture series on the present and future of the doctor-patient relationship is um, Dr. Andrea um, Leap. Um, she is an assistant professor of neurology at the Mayo Alex um, School of Medicine located in Rochester, um, Minnesota. She's a consultant there in the education division of the Department of Neurology. And in addition to her consulting, she's um, director of the learning and environment and education culture for the, the Mayo Clinic um, School of Medicine. Also the co-director of the Karen National Network for Caring and Character in Medicine and associate director of the Mayo Clinic in Professionalism and Value and the quality chair for the Department of Neurology um, at Mayo. Um, Dr. Lee received her medical degree at, at Mayo Clinic and then, and then stayed there, um, completing her um, residency in neurology and a fellowship in clinical neurophysiology before um, joining the faculty there. Um, somewhere along the way, she also obtained a master's in health professions education from the University of Illinois at Chicago. And we have some of our faculty who have also done that and really love that, that program. Dr. Leap's mission is to support healthcare faculty, staff, students, and leaders in co-creating environments that reflect shared professional values to promote learning and to serve patients. Her professional interests include professional identity formation and professionalism, character formation and expression, as well as performance assessment and performance enhancement. She also strives to teach her trainees about the cost effectiveness of care. And her talk today is entitled High Value Care, I'm Counting the Cost. Please um, join me in welcoming Dr. Leap. the last time that you had an encounter with a physician or some sort of healthcare clinic. Where were you? Why were you there? How'd you feel? Get that situation in your mind. And then think, did you notice anything about cost-conscious care in that encounter? Everybody happen to see a situation in the kitchen class? Did you notice anything? If you did, do you think it promoted your relationship with that individual? Or maybe detracted from it? Or maybe you didn't notice it at all and wished you had? Or noticed it and wished you hadn't? Did you even think you had a relationship with the person you saw? Those are some of the questions I'm hoping we'll be able to unpack together. But before we dive into the details, let's step back a little bit and ask ourselves why we're talking about cost-conscious care in the physician-patient or clinician-patient relationship in the first place. How many of you have seen a graph that looks something like this? Yeah, most of us have, right? Healthcare spending is, you know, relentlessly increasing over time. One out of five dollars in our uh, economy spent on health care, totaling $8.2 trillion in 2019. This is twice what's spent on health care in other developed countries without a commensurate return on that investment in terms of health outcomes. At least that's what many argue, showing charts like this, where life expectancy is plotted against per capita spending. And you can see that the U.S. is a clear outlier here, spending more than anyone else without a life expectancy gain to show for it. More sobering are estimates that a quarter of the spending is wasted on inefficient, ineffective, unnecessary, overpriced, or fraudulent services. Now, as a physician, this is startling to me. But I didn't go to medical school to treat the GDP, right? And we've heard people say that. We're here to think about the physician-clinician-patient relationship. So what do these individuals think about this, what's been called crisis of healthcare costs? 
surveys of physicians show that the majority agree they should be solely devoted to individual patients' best interests, even if that's expensive. At the Mayo Clinic, we say the needs of the patient come first. And the vast majority disagree with what could be described as rationing, denying beneficial but costly services to certain patients because they should go to other patients who need them more. But at the same time, 85% of physicians think they have a responsibility to try to contain costs and think physicians should take a more prominent role in limiting the use of unnecessary tests. These survey responses seem potentially conflicting <coughs> and likely reflect the tensions that we in healthcare face between meeting the needs of the patients in front of us and stewarding societal resources on behalf of all patients. What about patients? Folks have asked them what they think too. And the vast majority agree healthcare costs are a major problem in the United States. But when you bring it down to that clinician-patient relationship, you don't really want to see that conversation happening there. I don't feel that costs to society are part of the conversation. Physician's supposed to be my advocate. Cost to my insurance company? Let's debate that in the halls of Congress. I don't want to have this debate in my physician's office when my health is at stake. Let my doctor be my doctor. Let's keep the two separate. And I think this one sums up how many feel, how can you put a price on my life? Some tests are only going to save a few lives, but one of, what if one of those lives is yours? And it's understandable when you're in a situation where your health is at risk, or the health of someone you care about is threatened, that that's going to be the most salient thing in your mind not the more intangible idea of societal resources. So different strategies have been devised to help clinicians engage patients in cost-conscious conversations, to help them weigh that cost to society when making decisions. I'm going to share five of them, and I want you to listen and think, because at the end, I'm going to ask people to raise their hand and tell me, uh, and vote for which of the five they think patients like the best, OK? So here's number one, fairness. Everyone's interested in keeping health care costs down, and we're trying to do it in a fair way. In this situation, I would recommend a CT scan to all of my patients instead of an MRI. OK, strategy one, fairness. Strategy two, shared sacrifice. It's good for us to share responsibility for keeping costs down. At the end of the day, we all pick up the tab when we pursue expensive care because premiums rise. So keeping costs down is good for you in the long run. Number three, good enough. I really think a CT scan is a reasonable option. It might not find quite as many things as an MRI, but I believe it will find the important things, and it's certainly good enough for what we're trying to do. Four, shared decision-making. What are your thoughts about going with the CT scan? Let's talk whether the MRI is worth that extra $500 that your insurance or Medicare, Medicaid are going to be paying. Or maybe five, altruistic appeals. Not taking antibiotics for your sinus symptoms now will help prevent antibiotic resistance. And that means when someone else needs antibiotics for a serious infection, they'll be more likely to help. So what do you think? Who thinks number one, fairness? That, which one do you like the best? Any votes for number one? OK, we have a couple votes for number one. It's fair. We're treating all the patients the same way. How about number two, shared sacrifice? People don't like that one as much, right? Yeah, that sacrifice seems kind of unpleasant. How about good enough? Never I'd be better, but a CT is good enough for what our purpose is. So we have at least a vote for good enough. A two, three, yeah, four. How about oh, shared decision making? All right, you want to be able to like weigh the societal cost, the cost to the insurance company, and then decide. How about altruistic appeals? 
kind of like this one. You know, I'm making a decision that's for the good of everybody. But people have studied these approaches with patients and had them react to different types of strategies. And guess what? They didn't like any of them. <laughs> Basically, the, the quotes from these uh, qualitative focus groups were something like this. If the doctor's going to tell me he's recommending a CT scan basically because it's cheaper, there's nothing he can say to make that sound right. Or this one I got a kick out of. It's totally funny because I agree with that thing about keeping costs down and helping me in the long run. But I don't want my doctor saying that to me. I might say it to him, but I don't want him saying it to me. So none of these strategies really seem to resonate with most patients. So we've spent some time learning about what clinicians and what patients think about this idea of societal costs and considering those costs in the physician-patient relationship. But what, actually, what do they actually do in practice? And this is the work of the Dartmouth Atlas Group who's been creating maps like this for quite a long time where they look at regional variations in healthcare spending. And you can see this one's from some years ago now, but I grew up in rural Montana. And it's, we're usually the pale end, right? There's not a lot of per capita spending relative to other places in the country where there's much, much more. And you think this difference in spending might be related to better outcomes, more bang for your buck. Well, there's more services. In higher spending areas, there's more beds, there's more physicians, there's more specialists. But you can see on the slide, there's not a real convincing case to be made that outcomes are better for all that extra expense. Higher mortality, worse care coordination, and even the patients aren't that much happier, or sometimes they are less happy with the care. So this mismatch also, it provided another way of highlighting the fact that there's waste in the system, and that some of the spending must be unnecessary. And how might spending more lead to worse outcomes? That's sort of counterintuitive. But you can see that the more care, there's more diagnosis, more treatment, more to do, and more potential for all sorts of harms. I was also interested in my role of learning environment of how these regional variations impact our future physician workforce, our learners. And studies in residents, of residents have shown that the intensity of care in the region where they went to the residency training predicts their future knowledge, their future attitudes, and their future behaviors with respect to cost-conscious care. And these associations have led folks to hypothesize that there may, there may be this imprinting process whereby residents start to develop practice patterns that resemble those they see in their learning environment. <clears throat> but what about medical students? So we did some surveys of medical students across the country at nine or 10 different schools, geographically dispersed. We first looked at their attitudes toward cost-conscious care, and they differed significantly from physicians, um, even those that were youngest and most proximate to them in age. And overall, we're more favorable toward cost-conscious care. We can talk about why that may be. And they report engaging in cost-conscious, high-value behaviors themselves. So they'll ask questions about the cost of care or try to figure out how much something costs. But they also report engaging in behaviors that are not very cost-conscious and are low-value such as ordering a test just to show off their ability to generate a wide differential diagnosis. I remember wanting to do that. Maybe it's Whipple's disease, you know, something along those lines. Or to satisfy curiosity or build clinical experience. You know, ordering an ABG because you're trying to learn how to draw blood gases, right? Some of these examples are on the Choosing Wisely list for medical students of things not to do. And we looked at whether these self-reported behaviors related to care intensity in the region of their medical school, and indeed the students who were in more intense uh, utilization regions reported more low-value behaviors. So this imprinting process may start even earlier than residency for affecting our medical students in their very beginning clerkships. So what is it in the learning environment? And we hypothesized that role modeling may have a particularly influential role. 
So we then did surveys to look at what role modeling behaviors our students were reporting seeing in the clinical learning environment. <laughs> and they see cost-conscious behaviors. They see physicians discussing costs of care or explaining why a test is unnecessary and would generate an unnecessary cost. But they also see potentially wasteful behaviors. Unnecessary referrals, ordering more expensive things because that's what a patient asked for. Or criticizing a training for failing to order something on a stable, routine labs on a stable patient. And when we combine these into cost conscious and potentially wasteful <coughs> role modeling scales, we saw that students in regions with more intense use of resources, higher spending, saw fewer cost-conscious role modeling behaviors, or reported seeing fewer such behaviors. So it's clear, I think, that our learning environment, the culture of the practice of medicine, is not only an issue for clinicians and patients now, but it's something we need to think about for the future physicians that we're training up to engage in those relationships down the road. This is my first placeholder slide to pause and see if you have any questions. I think there's maybe time for a couple questions now, and we'll have a couple more opportunities along the way. I have a question. Yeah. <clears throat> so how much do you think somebody like me and back in the first floor really affect how the medical students do in the future? So, how much can we mold it? How much can, I mean, how much of what we do really teach in 20 years from now, what to do with stuff like That's a great, it's a great question. So people have asked the students that question. There's an interest in measuring the learning environment as part of the accreditation expectation for medical schools. So people have measured all sorts of different dimensions of the learning environment and asked students to rate the things that are the most influential and role modeling consistent in relationships with faculty, consistent when it comes out on top. So the students say it makes a difference. Now, how durable is that difference? Well, those studies, now these are of residents, but where they train predicts their practice patterns five, 10, 15 years down the road. So that suggests it has a pretty durable response, at least in residents. Now, whether that, uh, does the, what happens during medical school may be trumped by what happens in no, the medical school setting. Yeah. So I don't know that anyone's looked into that, but it's an interesting and important question. Yeah. How do you expect attendings, residents to teach and educate patients, med students, and people lower than them about cost conscious care when they don't even know how much something costs themselves? Right. So lab big barrier for every stakeholder, right? It's a barrier for the clinicians, for the patients, for the learners. So, and we'll touch on this later, but people have advocated, um, Dr. Aurora and others, for this idea of having universal precautions. We don't know how much a test is gonna cost for this patient right here with their insurance in this hospital at this time and place in the world, but let's, treat as if it could be a burdensome expense to them and the rest of society, and what can we do to be mindful of that? I think also, just being explicit, because sometimes this reasoning is happening inside our heads, but it's not coming out of our mouths in a way that's explicit to learners. So one of the theories I have, if we go back around, um, why isn't, why aren't regional practice patterns associated with more potentially wasteful behaviors? And it could be that a student is not in a position to recognize how much something costs, or whether it was necessary or unnecessary, or if the, the attending ordered the test just to protect against malpractice, or for some other reason. So those influences in the environment might be less visible to students, and, and and it's underreported. We want to be. Yeah. I imagine it's hard to change the culture in medical school. And instead of instead of trying to do that, I wonder about just rating medical schools on cost consciousness. And that way applicants can direct themselves according to their 
career, and that's an important thing to them in their career. So the Dartmouth Atlas has done the, just that. At least they used to have a website that was targeting students and shared this type of data with them and said, you might want to think about where you go to train and make a choice deliberately that's going to you know, inculcate you with these high value lens. There's also some of the more provocative conclusions from those studies in residence where should the US government allocate the money to GME education according to regional healthcare intensity or spending and try to shift it in that fashion. So those are, those are some of the conversations that are definitely happening as a result of this work. Yeah, one more question. Um, I wonder if there could be a study looking at trends and training evaluations and cost consciousness. Yeah, I think that's something we've thought hard uh, long about at Mayo Clinic because I know when I was a student, I think if I had said, are you sure that's might not, I don't think the result's going to change management or I didn't order a lot of things, uh, I would be worried I might get a worse evaluation. So how could we put these items at a more granular level on the students and faculty evaluations, faculty and students evaluations, as something we are priming our faculty and students to watch for and think about. Yeah. One more? Yeah, one more. So, um, you know, we have other tools that we also use to try to control resource utilization, like payment models, managed right. care, and so on. Yeah. Has anyone ever studied whether the correlation between where a resident comes from and the poor medical student and their spending varies according to the environment in which to which they go? I am not aware of that other than this these studies of residents. So they were actually studies of physicians looking at their sure. practice patterns resemble the residency environment more than their current environment. Yeah, it would be interesting to see whether if you look at a bunch of physicians who come from varying environments within a given payment environment ah, to understand how much it still plays out there or whether in fact there's a tremendous amount of homogenization that happens once people arrive. And um, My guess, anytime anyone's ever looked at any unit of analysis, there's a lot of variation. Sure. So I'm guessing that we would see, continue to see individual level variation. I've looked at the folks in my own department, there's huge individual variation in the same sort of practice setting in terms of resource utilization. People have looked at patients who move and the intensity, you know, because people, many doctors will say, well, since patients asking me for all these unnecessary things, I want to have good scores because it's linked to my salary, you know, my payment, my um, salary. And so people looked at patients and when they move, the care they receive resembles the practice pattern of that region, not where they came from. So patients may be less of a driver to be <clears throat> Now, we've been thinking about the clinician-patient relationship as this dyad, but to your point, in reality, since the mid-1900s, correct me if I'm wrong, there's almost always some third-party payer involved. <clears throat> We've done one study looking at trying to simultaneously measure the perspectives of these three different stakeholders. We didn't ask the payer, but we asked administrators and operations managers and the sort of people who think about the bottom line. And they were the most likely to think physicians have a responsibility to be cost conscious, to incorporate costs in the daily practice, and they saw far fewer drawbacks to cost conscious care than either physicians or patients. So these different stakeholders have different perspectives. So how did we get to this place? So looking backward for a moment, this is a chart showing different sorts of payment models, from fee-for-service on the left to capitated payments for an entire population on the right, and the attendant risk of overuse on the one side and underuse on the other. Early on, fee-for-service you know, was the predominant model, it still is in many respects. And around the 1980s here, it's recognized that healthcare costs are going up. And at this point, it's 10% of the GDP, and it's already being called a crisis, right? It's doubled that now, it's still being called a crisis. So there was this big interest in cost containment, cost reduction. 
So what happened? So Medicare created their diagnosis-related group system where they bundled payments for episodes of care in the hospital. And there was this big movement toward HMOs, which were managed by insurance companies and promised to control costs without passing along the financial risk to patients. But they did that by using primary care providers as gatekeepers. You couldn't get access to testing or specialists without going through your primary care doctor. And there was this onerous pre-approval utilization review process through the insurance company. That was matched by, that's a supply side intervention. I, I'm not an economist, so forgive me if this is a big simplification. But there were also demand side efforts underway, including this famous study that looked at uh, how patients utilize healthcare services when they have different skin in the game. So you can see that patients in the purple here had access to care for free, and they used more care. And the patients in the white blue had to pay 95% of the cost, and they used less care. And overall, there were no huge differences in health outcomes between these two groups. So there was this demand side effort to have patients have some skin in the game. Now, unfortunately, patients when they have access to care, they use more necessary and unnecessary care. And when they have more skin in the game, they use less unnecessary care and less necessary care. So this isn't a perfect solution, but this is the type of work that was happening at that time. And sure enough, there was a plateau. This contributed to a plateau in health care spending uh, growth during that decade, and even a reduction in out-of-pocket costs. <coughs> However, this was not popular. Physicians lamented the loss of professional autonomy and having to get approval for everything they thought was right for their patient and all the administrative hassle that came along with that. And then this perception among clinicians and patients that insurance companies were rationing and putting profit before the needs of patients. And that led to a big erosion of trust. And I think we still see that erosion now. This is from a study looking at patient perspectives on evidence-based medicine. And there's this kind of underlying current of skepticism that many have. Is this information driven by research or by someone wanting to save money? I think they're thinking about the cold, hard calculations that they don't want to pay out. So we're still facing this erosion of trust around anything that might be smack of being intended to save costs. So, in the early 2000s, professional societies like the AMA and others came out with statements about how the physician's duty to individual patients comes first, but that physicians also have this professional obligation to steward healthcare resources. And in 2008, the healthcare community really rallied around the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, Triple A, which included costs which had kind of dominated the conversation before. But it also included costs in relation to patient experience of care and the quality of care, population health outcomes. And by considering costs in relation to quality, the focus shifted from cost consciousness to a language that talked about value and the appropriateness of care. And that's on a continuum, right? I think you heard some of this from Dr. Levinson, perhaps, when she was here recently. So overuse of care that's unnecessary, ineffective, and potentially harmful. Underuse of effective care, and then misuse, uh, where it's inappropriately used, and appropriate use. And this language seems to resonate a lot more with the healthcare community, and gave rise to the Choosing Wisely campaign, trying to bring this into the professional and the public consciousness. And if you look at clinicians, 87% will say they talk to their patients about an, avoiding unnecessary tests, but only 20% talk to their patients about cost. So I think this illustrates how value and appropriateness of care um, is going to resonate more with physicians and other clinicians. And patients, the same way, they, they get this idea that a doctor can recommend against a test or treatment if it's unlikely to be beneficial, and that I can play a role in reducing costs by not requesting unnecessary, potentially harmful care. And I think what makes this easy at first blush is that 
much of the conversation about overuse and misuse is in this square down here, right? It's bad for the patient and it's bad for society, so we can all agree not to do it. But there's a lot of gray area here, right? Because these concepts exist on a continuum, and so there's still a lot of situations in practice where it's going to be difficult to judge if this is something that's clearly overuse or appropriate care. That's the past. So where has that taken us now? Well, we have this triad of the payers. I think we also need to step one step a little bit further back to talk about the policymakers. There's been a shift in payment models from trying to reimburse based on the volume of care provided to the value of care provided. And so the Affordable Care Act, MACRA, these are now, they're built on top of that fee-for-service model that continues to be so common in our payment systems, but it layers on this mandatory reporting of different quality, safety, patient experience outcomes. And then offered shared savings if costs come in below, or shared risks if costs come in above. So they're trying to link incentives to value and reimbursement to value. The DRG bundling system didn't used to include the physician fees. Those were added in 2016. And some of the more alternative payment models are moving toward the other end of the spectrum here, so they're more of a capitated approach. But you may at first think, well, that sounds like those HMOs that nobody liked back in the 90s. But these are going to be managed by care delivery groups, not by insurance companies. The idea being that they're in a better position to make those judgments about what's appropriate for patients and how to make care more efficient. <coughs> these are the goals of this value-based reimbursement strategy, bringing accountability, promoting innovation, improving quality, and reducing costs. That's that triple aim, right? Whether this will achieve the goal, there's some debate, concerns about uh, you know, playing to the game, trying to perform well on one quality measure might lead you to perform worse on another, or to triage out patients who are going to bring down their scores and worsen inequities of care. It's expensive to measure all those quality and safety metrics. But most, or many, agree that this is nevertheless the direction we need to continue to try to go, even if it's not perfect yet. And the percent of payments linked to these types of models is gradually increasing over time. And there's corresponding efforts to build health insurance programs that incentivize value, too. You know, if I want to see my primary care provider for preventative care, I can do that for free. If I want to get cosmetic surgery or lift up my eyebrows, I'm going to pay a lot more. And that's built into my insurance, right? So we've stepped back a little to look at payers and policymakers. Any questions at this point in the conversation? Yeah. yeah. Or comments? I know you have There's a lot of expertise. A little, a little in this comment and a, yeah. and a little question. My concern about these value-based payment models and all the quality metrics that you describe is, is that the quality metrics are um, inadequately reflective of the experience of the small number of people in the system who experience the most complex episodes of care. And, and in fact, all the incentives are to do much, much less for those people. And in fact, to do more for the people who actually don't need care, but respond to the patient satisfaction surveys and everything else. I was just at a conference yesterday organized in Chicago about, about um, safety net providers. And it, I heard um, a speaker, I won't even mention who the speaker was, um, because it's sort of politically sensitive. But I, I, but I will say I was, I was dismayed that every one of my worst fears was supported by how value-based care was really being implemented. And so you, know, you sort of said, well, there's a lot of agreement that this is ha happening. And, um, I, I, I think you know what your slides show was that it was growing. It's growing. And I think that there's agreement that the direction is right. Yeah, that I'm not even sure. Implementation I, might be wrong. So this is sort so of like that's, my my comment. Not sure. <laughs> what I am convinced is that people making a whole big pile of money in healthcare agree that this is happening, and that it's important, and that managed care. This is their business, and I will add on top of that that the business of government is very often very closely tied to the business of healthcare business. 
So, um, you know, if, if, if you're involved in administering public benefits, managed care is sort of your best thing. Because you can offload your own plate responsibility for pretty much everything, um, financial and clinical, um, into another area. So I, I, I guess that's kind of my, my pushback, but, but also sort of my question. Uh, you know, are, uh, are, in fact, is there broad enthusiasm for these approaches outside of payers and people making money out of it? <laughs> I heard from your first comment that the answer may be. It varies. Perhaps no. I've seen some um, you know, proposals that we need to think about. We need to focus on our more, most needy populations. Chronic, multiple chronic illnesses, um, mental health, and that our quality measures are not targeting the patients who need them the most. So I've seen arguments to try to align our measurement, be more strategic about that. One of the most compelling things I've seen, which I don't think I have in this version of the talk, is when you plot healthcare spending compared to other developed countries, we look so much higher. But when you add spending on social services, those other countries are right up there with us. So there may be bigger questions we need to ask about where is the right place to invest our national dollars. Yeah. Yeah. I was really happy to hear David bring in, um, say what he said about driving this. And it seems that, that I mean, as a physician who's taking care of patients, this seems so onerous, you know, having to just be watched everything you do with the assumption that you're going to commit fraud. And this goes back to like the 90s when, you know, the cost was just going crazy because there are a lot of doctors who are just charging the highest rate for everything and just, you know, abusing the system. Yeah, abusing the system. But that became the common practice because they were encouraged to build the highest rate by administrators, you know, and so, so people felt powerless. And now, now basically we're all being punished for it. And this idea of, of always thinking about costs is just such a waste of time because what you really need to do is take care of the patient. This is what the patient needs, this is what they don't need. The cost of what it actually is going to come down to is, you know, is really a secondary phenomenon. And a lot of those costs are deeply inflated by people who are making tons of money on this. I think it's time we, you know, address the elephant in the room, which is <coughs> sorry, the huge amounts of money that people are making, including many doctors. And you know, it's time for us to make, perhaps make less money and, and get people out of there, who, out of this, seeing this as the investment. I mean, people are, are making huge amounts of money on death and dying of our patients. And it seems like a basically. <clears throat> yeah, we have a misalignment of incentives and interests, right, that are not centered around patients the way they should be. Well, I mean, yeah, and but but making physicians, you know, accountable for every move they make, because it is just going to add so much waste and so much wasted documentation and time and money keeping track of all that nonsense. Yeah, I heard. But, but I, yeah. I, don't, I don't understand why you you're so excited about. It. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have aspirational hopes. <laughs> and how, well, a lot of the burden of documentation is being put on physicians and that frontline dyad, the, the biggest drivers of waste live in other places that we need to think about in other ways. So, I, we, yeah. So, I have probably a little bit of a big picture question. Uh, we don't have a similar one single cost structure for any of the other services in this country in the world. So, uh, if you want to travel with, with, a, uh, with a plane, you can choose to be coach, business, first class. If I want to send an envelope, it could be USPS, FedEx. But now it feels like we're trying to create this one cost structure for the entire population. <coughs> is it even feasible or is it reasonable to do that? Why don't we give people different options? So 
I don't know, the economists in the front row have any thoughts about that? Well, I'm not even sure it's true about the planes, right? I mean, <laughs> we're all on the same plane and you live or die together, so even that doesn't exactly work. Some people get bigger seats. Yeah, that, that's true. But it's, 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 is that there's a societal interest in the health of everyone, and that probably imposes a minimum. <coughs> we probably do have a tiered system in reality, if we admit it. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we're, we're moving even closer to it now, probably, including in our locality, um, you know, than, than we were in, in the past. Um, Makers, the complexity that surrounds that, how something that sounds good in theory might really fall flat and short of its goal in practice or even be antithetical to what it's trying to achieve. I like the things that Don Berwick's written. He's written a great paper about era three in medicine, moving from all this measurement and accountability to more of a professionalism model that doesn't punish all the physicians for the few that are doing things fraudulently and irresponsibly. And he raises this important point that anytime you're talking about value, there's this question, the elephant in the room of value from whose perspective? Is this the payer and the people profiting off of this model or is this the clinicians and their patients? In healthcare, because it's set up as a profession, this sort of implication is that we professionals are in the best position to judge the value of the care. But in other industries, service industries and products, excellence is in the eye of the consumer. So I think that begs the question, I mean, there's a bigger question of whether payers and policymakers see eye to eye with what patients need and want, but also whether we as clinicians and physicians see eye to eye with our patients. I know as a neurologist, you know, at a tertiary referral center, we get unusual things. We do these big workups and get really excited to make an esoteric diagnosis. But then at the end of the day, what the patient really wants is to feel better, to be able to hold their granddaughter, to play their saxophone in their band. And all of that energy around the diagnosis <coughs> You know, people care about knowing that, that information and what to expect down the line, but it falls a little flat. The excitement that's in the workroom when you're rounding can fall a little flat when you're at the bedside of the patient. And when you think about how patients judge value, what patients tell us is that they're inferring value from the quality of their relationship with the clinician and the degree to which the care they receive makes them able to achieve their life goals and live in alignment with their priorities their ability to live life as normally as possible. And this isn't always how we as doctors think about things. Patient-centered care, I think, can be taken to a whole new level. And this idea of having respect for patients on their terms helps me understand why my grandpa's a farmer in Montana. When his cardiologist told him he needed a pacemaker and defibrillator, he said, heck no. I said, grandpa, why not? Um, sudden death, and he says, well, the place where they're going to put that pacemaker, I use that shoulder to open gates. I do open gates. That didn't make sense to me, but that was really important to him, and it wasn't until his cardiac condition interfered with his ability to open gates that he was ready to think about that fibrillator and pacemaker. I had a similar conversation with his brother, who had a diagnosis of esophageal cancer in August, I heard of this, they're in rural Montana. I quickly scrambled to try to get him an appointment with an oncologist at Mayo. I called us, I didn't get you in next week. And he said, but it's harvest. <laughs> I said, but you have cancer. <laughs> he said, but it's harvest. So there can be this mismatch. And I think the same with evidence-based medicine, right? We look at these studies of populations that give results that are averages. But patients are individuals. And they want to be seen as individuals, not only as individuals, 
But as individuals with a unique life story, with a unique context, people who think about health in different ways, the different ways that people in the US conceptualize health, its capacity, control, physical well-being, or psychosocial well-being, the combinations of these. And they might prioritize health in different ways relative to other dimensions of human flourishing. So for my grandpa, deriving a lot of meaning and purpose from being out, able to out work on a farm or to my uncle to finish harvest was more important to them than optimizing physical health, which is the lens I was bringing to my conversations with them. So if we look toward the future, I think we need to ask some of these hard questions about what my colleague Dr. Victor Montori says, do we care more about value than we value caring? Have we gotten this order backwards? And what does this mean for the physician-patient relationship? You know, in the olden days, it was paternalistic. Some patients want a more autonomous relationship. There's this move to shared decision-making, a more equitable. That requires a lot more transparency around data than we have right now. Well, maybe a collaborative model where we recognize that each brings their own expertise. Physician supportive, but patient proactive to create this understanding together and optimize a care plan that is right for that person's life. One of my jobs as quality chair from the Department of Neurology is to read our patient experience survey comments. This is one I came across that I think highlights this idea. She should lose that I'm a doctor and you're not attitude. Her talents speak for themselves. I wasn't there to dispute anything, but it's my life, my body. I live with it every day, so I have some knowledge about that. I think we need to think about patients as being experts in their own life. We're experts in medicine, and that combination can really take patient-centered care and what we mean when we talk about value in a more patient-centered direction. And there's movements on the patient side of things. The Society for Participatory Medicine talks about e-patients. And I think any of you who are in practice you know, will recognize this idea of equipped, enabled, empowered, engaged, evaluating patients who are looking you up before they come to see you to see what your scores are and you want to be treated as a tool. Now, that doesn't mean that that collaborative or uh, participatory model is the right for every setting, but I think we're going to see more of that. This is a five-step framework for promoting value in clinical encounters, taking it all the way back down to that clinician-patient dyad, starting with understanding the benefits, harms, and relative costs. <coughs> so that your point about we don't even have access to that data, there's a long way we need to go for, to even do step one. But it's work that needs to happen. And then having what we call less is more conversations, but not framing it as appeals to save societal resources, but using more of that choosing wisely lens of this is unnecessary care that you don't need and could potentially harm you. And this is an infographic we've created out of some of um, Dr. Aurora's work and others around how to have these less is more conversations with students, listening to where the patient's coming from, making it clear that you're on their side, Explaining your reasoning without appeals to society, because that comes across in rationing or putting costs first. And then having a, a clear plan for follow-up, which is part of that relationship. Choosing interventions and care settings that will max that will achieve the triple aim, basically, right? Maximize benefits, minimize harms, and reduce costs. And then this important part of customizing care to the individual in front of you. That can be done using decision aids, and I know um, there are many places that you can go to access these. Uh, we've created some at the Mayo Clinic as well. You can really see when you watch the videos how these change that interaction to be much more collaborative. This is one that I like. It's designed for patients with multiple chronic illnesses to think more broadly about what areas of their life are a satisfaction or a burden or goals and how maybe the care we're providing is aggravating the problem versus helping it. 
and try to have those more customized, individualized conversations about what's high value for that person and their life. <coughs> we haven't talked a lot about out-of-pocket costs. Those are going up too. To your point about if we don't know what the cost is to society, much less the cost to a patient, you can screen for financial harm using questions like, are you worried about how your care will be paid for? Do you sometimes skip medications or cut back because of cost and the like? And that will help prime you to pick up these concerns. Patients are sometimes reluctant to bring it up, but when you ask, many of them would like to talk about it. So we can help them with that. And then finally, not forgetting about those systems level opportunities to create a more high value system that's focused on the needs of the patient. And to your point about sources of waste, you know, the physicians, if I look at this list, which of the ones sticks out to me as where, where I can have the most immediate impact is that overuse, low value care. But the biggest drivers there are administrative complexity from so many different models and all of the work that goes into that. Pricing failures. That's a whole complex issue of its own. And then lack of care delivery and coordination, which is really where some of the system's energy um, could be focused. What's a pricing failure? So that's how prices, so if you look, for example, at multiple sclerosis drugs, there's, you know, 15 or so of them, and the cost is, even the ones that have been around for 20 years, well, that's, it's a, uh, that's a success for the people who are. <laughs> yeah, a failure from whose perspective. Yeah, I actually learned the other day that the government pays more for the like 15 MS drugs, three times more than all of neurologists. Wow. And that just, I mean, that kind of put it in stark perspective to me around this pricing issue, or pricing success, I suppose, if you ask uh, someone else. Now, we've also asked medical students, you know, there's an interest in getting students engaged in promoting value. And when you ask them what they're interested in doing, they tend to rate patient care things, that's the blue bars, higher. They're more interested in that than the systems things, that's the red. And I think it's just harder to kind of get their head around the system, what it means to improve a system. So helping, I think as educators and role models, we can help our learners really see what the end, who we're all here for, right? It's the patients. And when you're working on a quality improvement project or a, a systems project, this is, you know, that the end beneficiary of that effort, and hopefully that will help bolster interest and engagement so that someday we have a system that is more centered around the patient. Any questions? Yes. Um, it seems to me that uh, some of the problems it lies in the couple of the slide you showed before. <coughs> I'm not a sociologist, but I studied some of this. 10% of the cost of medicine is through fraud, right? So that's the cost of medicine, but who is supposed to prevent the fraud? Second, 10% of them is cost the malpractice. Not just lawyers say it's 2 to 3%. But it is 10% when we call unnecessary tests for the people. A lot of MRI that they do one after each other, and that is estimated to be the cost. 10% of that is waste. In other words, people have medicine they don't use. That is, if you take the medicine that in some of the nurses' home collected, you could give it for another city and do that. So 10% of the cost are social illness that it has come to the cost of medicine. Now, people, no different from animals, behave the way that environment imposes on them. So if the cost is very high, then the people charge very more. I could say that if you cancel all MRI and you put it CT scan, the cost of CT will go up as much as MRI. If you just only do an X-ray and nothing else, the cost is going just as much because 
the people have to pay for their expenses. Now, when I was a resident here, we had one lawyer, not a real lawyer, a secretary on the fifth floor in order to fill out charge somebody wants. Now we have a corridor. Okay. The Parliament of Surgery, I was, we had two secretaries. One for the chief and American public surgeon, and the other one for the whole. We have a corridor of 40 people because they have to deal with insurance. So the cost is very high. That's what we need. That's why you could get an MRI scan in another country for $1,000 and read for you, but here is 7,000 and 2,000 for reading. So it's a, you cannot separate saving and all these things, good things that you did, from our social illnesses. That's a very important point. And if you look at, you know, drivers of overuse, when it comes, you know, physicians will talk about patients asking for these tests, but concern about malpractice right up there at the top. And that's not teased out on the table like this. And I was shocked too, I was talking to one of our leaders in quality in the something like $15 million or something, just on the measures. Um, I had a stick, my jaw dropped when I heard that number, right? For, for an organization to collect and compile and report all that data. So it's a complicated issue and as clinicians and patients, we're embedded in the, in the middle of that. And so trying to find tools to navigate the system as best we can while advocating for change in broader ways. This morning, we, our resident presented two bullet injuries to the brain. Now, these patients require costs, a lot of time. They don't have insurance. So, the cost of bullets and all this, and not only bullets, the number is 100 times more than many other countries. That is a social illness that we cannot calculate, and then we tell someone, OK, don't have an MRI and have a CT instead. Maybe we need to be thinking not just about physical illnesses. Yeah, I think it, you have to be economists and sociologists and all get together in order to come something that it is workable. Follow up to that. Oh, yeah. I just want to bring up another idea about the waste. Because the waste, if you look at really carefully, is a kind of a pain side perspective. After things happen, then you look back say, oh, this is, shouldn't happen because it's waste. You didn't use that. But if we look forward as a doctor, as a physician, we're prescribing drugs or uh, assign those examinations, you should have a reason to do that. You're not thinking, oh, it's a waste, and then I, I do this. No, it's the way you look forward. But you look back, then you know it's waste. So I don't think that really works. This is one, one of the idea. Waste is the kind of thing that you look hang something. And the other thing is, uh, there was a slide showing that Hispanic American healthcare is really exploding like a, a hill going upward. But if you look at the SP 500, the, the stock market index, it's going the same way. Why that? Because of the economy. The, the Federal Reserve are giving out money, giving away money to this economy. The economy is going up forward, so we have more money, so we, our spending is increasing. And because people are able to pay their medical, practice, medical costs, either because of the government insurance or private insurance, so doctors can prescribe these drugs and they can do these donations. So the spending are increasing the same speed as P500 is going up because of the economy. If the economy is not going up like those poor countries or like those European countries you may just mention, their economy is going like flat. Then their healthcare spending, if you take a look into it, aren't just like flat because healthcare spending is part of our economy. It goes up to where we our economy. So this is of course, if you see this in a bigger picture, you see that. And there is another thing I want to mention about your talk to the patient is that there is an old economic joke saying that there is a farmer that wants to sell rice to a customer and uh, 
this, they have deep exist conflict between them because the farmer wants to make the price higher and the customer wants to make the price lower so they can make the deal done. If they think too much about other, the other one, then the deal will not be done. Let's, let's think about that. If the farmer wants to, oh, you're a student, you're too hard. I want to give you free lunch. And the student thinks, oh, you're a farmer, you're making this too hard. I really want you to, I really want to give you more money. Then they will not make the deal done. So as a doctor and patient, we need to make it like a, our whole purpose or should, should be give good health, not making the cost lower, right? Just like uh, Dr. Daniel said, the, per, uh, the main target should be give a good health, uh, just like Farrer and the, the customer, make the deal done. I want to rise, I want to, the money to go on, keep, keep in <coughs> harvesting these rises so the economy can work. Otherwise, the deal will not be done because... So I think, I think maybe that's why I smile when I think about value, because I see value as it's headed in the right direction from just thinking about cost. Because at least it's a more synthetic term. It's bringing the quality, the safety, the patient experience, the timeliness, the equity, the efficiency of care together relative to cost. And not just cost, but cost over time. And so by bringing those together, it lets us, at least in theory, focus more on what's the right thing to do, what's the appropriate thing to do, and what's for, instead of what's the cost efficient thing to do. It seems yeah. like, but it seems like you're using value in, in a couple different ways here. And in one way, it's it's tied to cost, but in other ways, it's it's not. It's tied to what the patient was want and the benefit. And so I think that it gets very confusing. Well, so if, so you know they, they talk about value as quality over cost. And some then, people do. Yeah, some people do. That's a common way of thinking about value. But quality, even in that frame. Quality has different dimensions of which patient-centered care is one. And that's lost in our, our discourse today is really an industrial economic discourse that talks about value is really is thinking about dollar signs and money. Right. And I think also your thing about you know being on the side of the patient. I think medical students, when they get in there, they actually are on the side of patients. And I think pretty yeah. soon after they become residents, they're no longer on the same side. <laughs> and I think that you know they switch they switch sides because it's you know the patient becomes this person that you want to get out of the hospital. Yeah. You know, and and I think that that's inculcated in residency, and I think it continues. You know, and that relationship. I think that raises another really important point about how we. We need a richer understanding of quality that elevates the patient perspective beyond where it is today. Right, and I think in order to do that, we have to forget about cost. And we need a more nuanced understanding of the cost. That's not just money, right? There's a cost to me as a resident being on call and meeting all these people. And there's a cost to patients of having to disrupt their lives and come in to see us. Time, inconvenience, anxiety, financial toxicity, all of those things. So thinking about quality in a more multidimensional way, thinking about cost in a more nuanced way, and thinking about maybe we just need to completely shift our discourse. My colleague, Dr. Montori, says, is healthcare an industrial enterprise where we're mobilizing, we're focusing on care to achieve our industrial needs? Or should we be thinking about care as the goal that we're mobilizing all our needs toward? And do we need to rethink our whole language? Maybe value is so seeped in the money and the finances that it's, it's lost its ability to serve that purpose. And maybe thinking more about something like kind and careful care is what he has proposed. Doesn't tolerate haste, doesn't tolerate waste. It's kind and careful to the person in front of us. So that may be a, a whole change of discourse, maybe what's required to navigate forward. Question? Yeah, yeah. The, the focus on quality, but, um, if that's where we need to move. Um, but that also requires measurement time and costly measurement of outcomes. And I think it's just uh, to kind of throw that to we don't want to do, we don't want to invest that extra time or that extra. Um, money into this, but we already spend a lot of time and money on billing for services, um, the cost side of care already. So many it's just dis seems disproportionate, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're willing to invest the time when it's going to reimburse us, but maybe not. So, so I'd like to ask a question, then one yeah. more from the audience. Yeah. Well, thank you. 
So I, I shared just before your talk that I'd recently seen this documentary about the, the Mayo Clinic that right. was um, made by Ken Burns. And anyone who hasn't seen this, I really recommend it. It's, I, I don't know if it's officially part of the American Experience series or not, but it's really extraordinary. And one of the things that it, it focuses on is, is the Mayo Clinic, Mayo Clinic's history as a referral center. People coming from very far away with problems they feel have gotten you know, not adequately addressed wherever they are. And I would imagine often looking for a very deep dive into a question. And I'm, what I'm curious about is as you train medical students and residents in that environment, and as you treat both people from the community and people who come from the opposite side of the world, how does the value discussion feed into the discussion about the difference between those two sets of patients? Does everyone get the same treatment, or do people get different treatments because of who they are, or where they come from, or, or what they want? So, the, the, tru the truism that circulates around the Mayo is said by one of our sisters, the nuns, who helped found Mayo Clinic together with the Mayo brothers. And it's no money, no mission. No mission, no money. So a lot of times when these debates and tensions come up, somebody will say that quote and will think about, you know, what does that mean in this particular instance? In terms of trying to serve different populations, I think the cost that's at the front of my mind when I'm taking care of patients is time. You know, somebody's traveled a long ways away, they're paying for a hotel, a dog sitter, a babysitter, um, if, uh, airline tickets, time away from work, and they're looking for answers. So the cost that I have in mind is less so money and more so time. Whereas if we have community patients, uh, that lens is different because they live right down the street and it's easier to provide longitudinal follow-up and not rely on tests, which don't have the luxury of that sort of time. So I think that illustrates how, and I try to like make sure to make that difference explicit for the trainees because I found, you know, doing all this destination medical center care, I had to sort of like flip a switch and be in a, have a different mindset in the community practice because that would be an undue burden to those folks, whereas it was maybe a high value to these folks. So I didn't think of it, I don't think of it so much as a tier as thinking about costs in a different way. And those are the kind of complicated trade-offs that we make as clinicians and patients and the ethical. Right. Yet another example. Which, as an economist, I'll just issue. point out, is yeah. fascinating because people pay for their own time and their own air ticket, but they don't pay for their own tests. Right. <laughs> so it's this interesting societal personal thing. And most of them have insurance. Yeah, yeah, but that's what so I meant. If you go there without insurance, you are not trauma center? I'm not sure. No, not so many yeah. people go there with bullets and with the injury it's and the car. It's rural Minnesota. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see the person who fell in the track. Yeah. Like, you know. <laughs> any, any last questions? Um, listen, thank you so much. What yeah. a wonderful. Yeah.